snake venoms are complex mixtures of proteins and are stored in venom glands at the back of the head. In all venomous snakes, these glands open through ducts in the grooved or hollow teeth in the upper jaw. These proteins can potentially be a mix of neurotoxins which attack the nervous system, hemotoxins which attack the circulatory system, cytotoxins, toxins and many other toxins that affect the body in different ways. Almost all snakes venom contains hyaluronidase. I really said that wrong. An enzyme that ensures rapid diffusion of the venom. Venomous snakes that use hemotoxins usually have fangs in the front of their mouths, making it easier for them to inject the venom into their victims. Some snakes that use neurotoxins, such as the mangrove snake, have fangs in the back of their mouths, with the fangs curled backwards. This makes it difficult both for the snake to use its venom and for scientists to milk them. Elapids, however, such as cobras and crates, are protogariophloas. They possess hollow fangs that cannot be erected towards the front of their mouth but cannot stab like a viper. They must actually bite the victim. It has recently been suggested that all snakes may be venomous to a certain degree, with harmless snakes having weak venom and no fangs. Most snakes currently labelled non-venomous would still be considered harmless according to this theory, as they lack either a venom delivery method or incapable of delivering enough to endanger a human. This theory postulates that snakes may have evolved from a common lizard ancestor that was venomous, and that venomous lizards like the Gila monster, the bearded lizard, monitor lizards, and the now extinct mosasaurs may have derived from it. They share this venom clade with various other saurian species. Venomous snakes are classified into two taxonomic families. The elipids, which include, you know, king cobras, crates, mambas, Australian copperheads, sea snakes and coral snakes, and viperids, vipers, rattlesnakes, copperheads, cottonmouths, and bushmasters. There is a third family containing the opistoglophicus, rear fanged snakes, as well as the majority of other snake species. The Colubrids, which includes boom slangs, tree snakes, vine snakes, mangrove snakes, although not all colubrids are venomous. Now on to snake reproduction. I always find the reproduction of snake quite gross, especially when there is they're in those big balls. Although a wide range of reproductive modes are used by snakes, all snakes employ internal fertilization. This is accomplished by means of paired forked hemopenes, which are stored inverted in the male's tail. The hemopenes are often grooved, hooked, or spined in order to grip the walls of the female's cloaca. Most species of snakes lay eggs, which they abandon shortly after laying. However, a few species, such as the king cobra, actually constructs nests and stays in the vicinity of the hatchlings after incubation. That's sweet. Most pythons coil around their egg clutches and remain with them until they hatch. A female python will not leave the eggs except to occasionally bask in the sun or drink water. She will even shiver to generate heat to incubate the eggs, which is interesting for something with cold blood to do. Some species of snake are oviviparous and retain the eggs within their body until they are almost ready to hatch. Recently, it has been confirmed that the several species of snakes are fully viviparous. 
Cheetahs, such as the boa constrictor and green anaconda, nourishing their young through a placenta as well as a yolk sac, which is highly unusual among reptiles and may I add very suspicious or anything else outside of requiem sharks or placental mammals. Retention of eggs and live birth are most associated with colder environments. Sexual selection in snakes is demonstrated by the 3,000 species that each use different tactics in acquiring mates. Ritual combat between males for the females they want to mate with includes topping, a behavior exhibited by most viperids, in which one male will twist around the vertically elevated forebody of its opponents and forcing it downwards. It is common for neck biting to occur while the snakes are entwined. Now on to facultative parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is a natural form of reproduction in which growth and development of embryos occur without fertilization. The Achinstrodon uncontorsix, the cropper head, and the Achistrodon piscophorus, the cotton mouth, can reproduce by facultative pathogenesis. That is, they are capable of switching from a sexual mode of reproduction to an asexual mode. This type of parthenogenesis that likely occurs is automixes with terminal fusion, a process in which two terminal products from the same meiosis fuse to form a diploid zygote. This process leads to genome-wide homozygosity. Expression of deleterious recessive alleles are often to develop mental abnormalities. Both captive-born and wild-born A. conotrix and A. piscophorus appear to be capable of this form of parthenogenesis. Reproduction in squamate reptiles is almost exclusively sexual. Males ordinarily have a ZZ pair of sexual determining chromosomes and females a ZW pair. However, the Colombian rainbow boa, the Epicrix morus, can be reproduced by facultative pathogenesis resulting in production of WW female progeny. The WW females are likely produced by terminal automesis. Now on to the behavior of the snake. The winter dormancy in regions where winters are colder than snakes can tolerate while remaining active local species will brumate. Unlike hibernation in which mammals are actually asleep, brumating reptiles are awake but inactive. Individual snakes may brumate in burrows, under rock piles, or inside fallen trees, or snakes may aggregate in large numbers at hibernacula. On to feeding and diet. All snakes are strictly carnivorous, eating small animals including lizards, frogs, other snakes, small mammals, birds, eggs, fish, snails, worms, or insects. Because snakes cannot bite or tear their food to pieces, they must swallow their prey whole. The body size of a snake has a major influence on its eating habits. Smaller snakes eat smaller prey. Juvenile pythons might start out feeding on lizards or mice and graduate to small deer or antelope as an adult, for example. The snake's jaw is a complex structure. Contrary to popular belief that snakes can dislocate their jaws, snakes have a very flexible lower jaw, the two halves of which are not rigidly attached, and numerous other joints in their skull. See the 
snake skull, allowing them to open their mouths wide enough to swallow their prey whole, even it is larger in diameter than the snake itself. For example, the African egg-eating snake has flexible jaws adapted for eating eggs much larger than the diameter of its head. This snake has no teeth, but does have bony protrusions on the inside edge of its spine, which it uses to break shells when it eats eggs. While the majority of snakes eat a variety of prey animals, there is some specialization by some species. King cobras and the Australian bandy bandy costume other snakes. Snakes of the family Peridae have more teeth to the right side of their mouths than on the left, as the shells of their prey usually spiral clockwise. Some snakes have a venomous bite which they use to kill their prey before eating it. Other snakes kill their prey by constriction. Still others swallow their prey whole and alive. After eating, the snakes become dormant while the process of digestion takes place. Digestion is an intense activity, especially after consumption of large prey. In species that feed only sporadically, the entire intestine enters a reduced state between meals to conserve energy. The digestive system is then upregulated to full capacity within 48 hours of prey consumption. Being ectothermic, cold-blooded, the surrounding temperature plays a large role in snake digestion. The ideal temperature for snakes to digest is 30 degrees, which is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So much metabolic energy is involved in a snake's digestion that in the South American rattlesnake, the Crotalus dirusus, surface body temperatures increase by as much as 1.2 degrees centigrade or 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit during the digestive process. Because of this, a snake disturbed after having eaten recently will often regurgitate its prey to be able to escape the perceived threat. When undisturbed, the digestive process is highly efficient, with the snake's digestive enzymes dissolving and absorbing everything but the prey's hair or feathers and claws which are excreted along with the waste. On to locomotion. The lack of limbs does not impede the movement of snakes. They have developed several different modes of locomotion to deal with particular environments. Unlike the gates of limbed animals which form a continuum, each mode of snake locomotion is discrete and distinct from the others. Transitions between modes are abrupt. Now on to lateral undulation. Lateral undulation is the sole. Lateral undulation is the sole mode of aquatic locomotion and the most common mode of terrestrial locomotion. In this mode, the body of the snake alternatively flexes to the left and the right, resulting in a series of rearward moving waves. While this movement appears rapid, snakes have rarely been documented moving faster than two body lengths per second, often much less. This mode of movement has the same net cost of transport, calories burned per meter moved, as running in lizards of the same mass. Terrestrial Lateral undulation is the most common mode of terrestrial locomotion for most snake species. In this mode, the posteriorly moving waves push against contact points in the environment, such as rocks, twigs, irregularities in the soil, etc. Each of these environmental objects in turn generates a reaction force directed forwards and towards the midline of the snake, resulting in forward thrust while the lateral component 
wave speed is precisely the same as the snake speed, and as a result, every point of the snake's body follows the path at the point ahead of it, allowing the snake to move through very dense vegetation and small openings. When swimming, the waves become larger as they move down the snake's body, and the wave travels backwards faster than the snake moves forwards. Thrust is generated by pushing their body against the water, resulting in the observed slip. In spite of overall similarities, studies show the pattern of muscle activation is different in aquatic versus terrestrial lateral undulation, which justifies calling them separate modes. All snakes can laterally undulate forwards with backward moving waves, but only sea snakes have been observed reversing the motion, moving backwards with forward moving waves. And on to side winding. Most often employed by colubrid snakes, colubrids, elapids, and vipers, when the snake must move in an environment that lacks irregularities to push against, rendering lateral undulation impossible, such as slick mud, flat or sand dune, side winding is a modified form of lateral undulation, in which all of the body segments oriented in one direction remain in contact with the ground while the other segments are lifted up, resulting in a peculiar rolling motion. This mode of locomotion overcomes the slippery nature of sand or mud by pushing off with only static portions of the body, thereby minimizing slipping. Interesting. The static nature of the contact points can be shown from the tracks of a side-winding snake which shows each belly scale imprint without any smearing. This mode of locomotion has very low caloric cost, less than one third of the cost for a lizard to move the same distance. Contrary the popular belief, there is no evidence that side winding is associated with the sand being hot. Certina. When push points are absent, but there is not enough space to use side winding between, because of lateral constraints such as tunnels, snakes rely on concertina locomotion. In this mode, the snake braces the posterior portion of the body against the tunnel wall, while the front of the snake extends and straightens a little bit like a worm. The front portion then flexes and forms an anchor point, and the posterior is straightened and pulled forwards. This mode of locomotion is slow and very demanding, up to seven times the cost of laterally undulating over the same distance. This high cost is due to the repeated stops and starts of portions of the body, as well as the necessity of using active muscular effort brace against the tunnel walls. Now interesting in arboreal habitats. The movement of snakes in arboreal habitats has only been recently studied. While on tree branches, snakes use several modes of locomotion, depending on the species and the bark texture. In general, snakes will use a modified form of concertina locomotion on smooth branches but will laterally undulate if contact points are available. Snakes move faster on small branches when contact points are present. In contrast to limbed animals which do better on large branches with little clutter. Gliding snakes of Southeast Asia launch themselves from branching dips spreading their ribs and laterally undulating as they glide between trees. These snakes can perform a controlled glide for hundreds of feet depending upon launch altitude and can even turn in mid-air. The slowest mode of snake locomotion is rectilinear locomotion, which is also the only one where the snake does not need to bend its body laterally though it may do so when turning. In this mode, the belly scales are lifted and pulled forwards before being placed down and the body pulled over them. Waves of movement and stasis pass posteriorly, resulting in a series of ripples in the skin. The ribs of the snake do not move in this mode of locomotion. 
function and this method is most often used by large pythons, boas and vipers. When stalking prey across open ground as the snake's movements are subtle and harder to detect by their prey in this manner. We are now on to the last category of interactions with humans. Snakes do not ordinarily prey on humans unless startled or injured. Most snakes prefer to avoid contact and will not attack humans. With the exception of large constrictors, non-venomous snakes are not a threat to humans. The bite of a non-venomous snake is usually harmless. Their teeth are not adapted for tearing or inflicting a deep puncture wound, but rather grabbing and holding. Although the possibility of infection and tissue damage is present in the bite of a non-venomous snake, venomous snakes present far greater hazard to humans. The World Health Organization lists snake bite under the other neglected conditions category. Documented deaths resulting from the snake bites are uncommon. Non-fatal bites from venomous snakes may result in the need for amputation of limbs or part thereof. Of the roughly 275 species of venomous snakes worldwide, only 250 are able to kill a human with one bite. Australia averages only one fatal snake bite per year, but in comparison in India, 250,000 snake bites are recorded in a single year, with as many as 50,000 recorded initial deaths. So, Australia is much more safer than India in terms of snakes. The WHO estimates that on the order of 100,000 people die each year as a result of snake bites, and around three times as many amputations and other permanent disabilities are caused by snake bites annually. The treatment for a snake bite is as variable as the bite itself. The most common and effective method is through anti-venom, a serum made from the venom of the snake. Some anti-venom is species-specific monovalent, while some is made for use with multiple species in mind, polyvalent. In the United States, for example, all species of venomous snakes are vipers with the exception of the coral snake to produce anti-venom a mixture of venoms of the different species of rattle snakes copperheads and cotton mouth is injected into the body of a horse in ever increasing dosages until the horse is immunized blood is then extracted from the immunized horse the serum is separated and further purified and freeze-dried interesting. It is reconstituted with its sterile water and becomes anti-venom. For this reason, people who are allergic to horses are more likely to suffer an allergic reaction to anti-venom. Wow! Anti-venom for the more dangerous species such as mambas, dipens and cobras is made in a similar manner in India, South Africa and Australia. Although these anti-venoms are species-specific onto snake charmers, in some parts of the world, especially in India, snake charming is a roadside show performed by a charmer. In such a show, the snake charmer carries a basket that contains a snake that he seemingly charms by playing tunes from his flute-like musical instrument to which the snake responds. Snakes lack external ears, though they do have internal ears, and respond to the movement of the flute, not the actual noise. The Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 in India technically prescribes snake charming on grounds of reducing animal cruelty. Other snake charmers also have a snake and mongoose show, where both the animals have a mock fight. However, this is not very common, as the snakes, as well as the mongoose, may be seriously injured or killed. Snake charming as a profession is dying out in India because of competition from modern forms of entertainment and environmental laws prescribing these practices. Good. Many Indians have never 
seen Snake Charming and it is becoming a folk tale of the past. Now on to Trapping. The Arulas tribe of Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu in India have been hunter-gatherers in the hot, dry plains forests and have been practicing the art of snake catching for generations. They have a vast knowledge of snakes in the field. They generally catch the snakes with the help of a simple stick. Earlier, the Arulas caught thousands of snakes for the snake skin industry. After the complete ban of the snake skin industry in India and protection of all snakes under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, they formed the Arula Snake Catchers Cooperative and switched to catching snakes for removal of venom. Releasing them in the wild after four extractions. The venom so collected is used for producing life-saving anti-venom, biomedical research, and for other medicinal products. The Arulas are also known to eat some of the snakes they catch and are very useful in rat extermination in the villages. Despite the existence of snake charmers, there have also been professional snake catchers or wranglers. Modern day snake trapping involves a herpetologist using a long stick with a V-shaped end. Some television shows like Bill Hast, Austin Stevens, Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin prefer to catch them using bare hands. Now on to the consumption of snakes. While not commonly thought of as food in most cultures, in others the consumption of snakes is acceptable or even considered a delicacy. Snake soup of Cantonese cuisine is consumed by locals in autumn to warm up their body. Western culture documented the consumption of snakes under extreme circumstances of hunger. Cooked rattlesnake meat is an exception which is commonly consumed in Texas and parts of the Midwestern United States. In Asian countries such as China, Taiwan, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam and Cambodia, drinking the blood of snakes, particularly the cobra, is believed to increase sexual virility. It's interesting how almost all of the really weird and messed up, you know, um, traditional alternative medicines have something about sex or penises in them. Very strange. The blood is drained while the cobra is still alive when possible and is mixed usually with some form of liquor to improve the taste. In some Asian countries, the use of snake in alcohol is also accepted. In such cases, the body of a snake or several snakes is left to steep in a jar or container of liquor. It is claimed that this makes the liquor stronger as well as more expensive. One example of this is the habu snake, sometimes placed in the Okinawan liquor habushu, also known as habu sake. Snake wine is an alcoholic beverage produced by infusing whole snakes in rice, wine or grain alcohol. The drink was first recorded to have been consumed in China during the Western Zhao dynasty and considered an important curative and believed to reinvigorate a person according to traditional Chinese medicine. Now on to them as pests. In the Western world, some snakes, especially docile species such as the ball python and corn snake, now on to them as pets. In the Western world, some snakes, especially docile species such as the ball python and corn snake, are kept as pets. To meet this demand, a captive breeding industry has developed. Snakes bred in captivity tend to make better pets and are considered preferable to wild-caught specimens. Snakes can be very low-maintenance pets, especially compared to more traditional species. They require minimal space, as more common species do not exceed 5 feet, which is 1.5 meters, in length. Pet snakes can be fed relatively infrequently, usually once every 5 to 14 days. Certain snakes have a lifespan of more than 40 years if given proper care. Now on to snakes in symbolism. In ancient Mesopotamia, Nira, the messenger god of Istaran, was represented 
represented as a serpent on a cuterus or the boundary stones. Representations of two intertwined serpents are common in Sumerian art and Neo-Sumerian artwork and still appear sporadically on cylinder seals and amulets until, until as late as the 13th century BC. The Horned Viper Serestes Serestes appears in Kassite and Neo-Assyrian Cuderus and is invoked in Assyrian texts as a magical protective entity, a dragon-like creature with horns and the body of a neck of a snake, the forelegs of a lion, the hind legs of a bird appears in Mesopotamian art from the Akkadian period until the Hellenistic period. This creature known in the Akkadian as the Musu, meaning furious serpent, was used as a symbol for particular deities and also as a general protective emblem. It seems to have originally been the attendant of the underworld god Nenatsu, but later became the attendant to the Hurrian storm god Tishpak, as well as later Ninsao's son Ningxingsadu. Babylonian national god Marduk, the scribal god Nabu, and the Assyrian national god Ashur. In Egyptian history, the snake occupies a primary role with the Nile cobra adorning the crown of the pharaoh in ancient times. It was worshipped as one of the gods and was also used for sinister purposes, such as the murder of an adversary or ritual suicide. See Cleopatra. The Ouroboros was the well-known ancient Egyptian symbol of a serpent swallowing its own tail. The precursor to the Ouroboros was the many-faced, a serpent with five heads who, according to the Amduat, the oldest surviving book of the afterlife, was said to coil around the corpse of the sun god Ra protectively. The earliest surviving depiction of a true Ouroboros comes from the gilded shrines in the tomb of Tutankhamun. In the early centuries AD, the Ouroboros was adopted as a symbol by Gnostic Christians. And chapter 136 of the Pistis Sophia, an early Gnostic text, describes a great dragon whose tail is in its mouth. In medieval alchemy, the Ouroboros became a typical Western dragon with a wing, with wings, legs, and a tail. In the Bible, King Nahash of Ammon, whose name means snake, is depicted very negatively as a particularly cruel and despicable enemy of the ancient Hebrews. The ancient Greeks used the Gorgonian a depiction of a hideous face with a serpents for hair as an apotropaic symbol to ward off evil. In Greek myth described by Pseudo Apollodorus in the Bibliotheca Medusa was a Gorgon with serpents for hair whose gaze turned all those who looked at her to stone, and was slain by the hero Perseus. Thumbs up for Perseus. In the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses, Medusa is said to have once been a beautiful priestess of Athena, whom Athena turned into a serpent-haired monster after she was raped by the god Poseidon in Athena's temple. In another myth referenced by the Boetian poet Hesoid, described in detail by Pseudo Apollodorus, the hero Heracles, is said to have slain the Lernian Hydra, a multiple headed serpent which dwelt in the swamps of Lerna. The legendary account of the foundation of Thebes mentioned a monster snake guarding the spring from which the new settlement was to draw its water. In fighting, and killing the snake, the companions of the founder, Cadmus, all perished, leading to the term Cadmian victory, meaning a victory involving one's own ruin. Three medical symbols involving snakes that are still used today are the bowl of Hygieia, symbolizing pharmacy, and the catechus, and the 
rod of Asclepius, which are symbols denoting medicine in general. One of the etymologies proposed for the common female first name Linda is that it might have derived from the old German Lindy or Linda, meaning a serpent. India is often called the land of snakes and is steeped in tradition regarding snakes. Snakes are worshipped as gods even today with many women pouring milk on snake pits despite snakes aversion for milk. The cobra is seen on the neck of Shiva and Vishnu is depicted often as sleeping on a seven-headed snake or within the coils of a serpent. There are also several temples in India solely for cobras, sometimes called Nagraj, the king of snakes, and it is believed that snakes are symbols of fertility. There is a Hindu festival called Nag Panchami each year in which the day the snakes are venerated and prayed to. See also the Naga. In India, there is also another mythology about snakes, commonly known in Hindi as Ikkikartari, snakes. Such snakes can take the form of any living creature, but prefer human form. These mythical snakes possess a valuable gem called Mani, which is more brilliant than diamond. There are many stories in India about greedy people trying to possess this gem and ending up getting killed. The snake is one of the twelve celestial animals of Chinese zodiac in the Chinese calendar. Many ancient Peruvian cultures worshipped nature. They emphasized animals and often depicted snakes in their art. On to religion. Snakes are a part of Hindu worship. A festival, Nag Panchami, in which participants worship either images or of live Nagras and Cobras is celebrated each year. Most images of Lord Shiva depict snakes around his neck. Buranas have various stories associated with snakes. In the Buranas, Shisha is said to hold all the planets of the universe on his hoods and to constantly sing the glories of Vishnu from all his mouths. He is sometimes referred to as an anti-shisha, which means endless shisha. Other notable snakes in Hinduism are Ananta, Vasuki, Taksa, Kakotaka, and Pingala. The term Naga is used to refer to entities that take the form of large snakes in Hinduism and Buddhism. Snakes have also been widely revered, such as in ancient Greece, where the serpent was seen as a healer. Asclepius carried a serpent wound around his wand, a symbol seen today on many ambulances. In religious terms, the snake and jaguar are arguably the most important animals in ancient Mesoamerica. In states of ecstasy, lords dance a serpent dance. Great descending snakes adorn and support buildings from Chien Itza and Tenochtitlan, and the Nahuatl word Kotl, meaning serpent or twin, forms part of primary deities such as Mitzakotl, Quetzalcoatl, and Coatlcu. In both Maya and Aztec calendars, the fifth day of the week was known as Snake Day. In Judaism, the snake of brass is a symbol of healing, of one life's being saved from imminent death. In some parts of Christianity, Christ's redemptive work is compared to saving one's life through beholding the Nehustan, the serpent of brass. Snake handlers use snakes as an integral part of church worship in order to exhibit their faith in divine protection. However, more commonly in Christianity, the serpent has been seen as a representative of evil and sly plotting, which can be seen in the description of Genesis in chapter 3 of a snake in the Garden of Eden, tempting Eve. St. Patrick is reputed to have expelled all snakes from Ireland while converting the country to Christianity in the 5th century, thus explaining the absence of snakes there. In Christianity and Judaism, the snake makes its infamous appearance in the first book of the Bible, where a serpent appears before the first couple, Adam and Eve, and tempts them with the forbidden fruit from the tree of 
knowledge. The snake returns in Exodus when Moses, as a sign of God's power, turns his staff into a snake. When Moses made the Nehustasan, a bronze snake on a pole that when looked at cure the people of bites from the snakes that plague them in the desert. The serpent makes its final appearance symbolizing Satan in the book of Revelation. And he laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. In neo-paganism and Wicca, the snake is seen as a symbol of wisdom and knowledge. Now moving to medicine, the last little category. Several compounds from snake venoms are being researched as potential treatments or preventatives for pain, cancer, arthritis, stroke, heart disease, hemophilia, and hypertension under control, bleeding, e.g. during surgery. I hope that you really liked this part one and two of me reading about the snake Wikipedia. Um, I recorded this all in one sitting, and this is probably the longest I've recorded without a break. That was the, um, my audio recorder says it's been two hours and five minutes for me, which is quite an intensely long amount of time to sit and read about snakes. So I really hope that you liked it. Thank you to whoever suggested that I should do snakes as a topic because there was so much interesting and wide and varying stuff. So thank you for that. And I'm very grateful that you chose to have a pause and a break.